Welcome to Influential Entrepreneurs, bringing you interviews with elite business leaders and experts, sharing tips and strategies for elevating your business to the next level. Here's your host, Mike Saunders. Hello and welcome to this episode of Influential Entrepreneurs. This is Mike Saunders, the Authority Positioning Coach. Today we have back with us Eddie James, who's the owner of Harvest Wealth Management, and we'll be talking about mitigating risks in retirement. Eddie, welcome back to the program. Thank you, Mike. Thank you for having me back there, sir. I I so appreciate uh, what you're doing there at Inspiring Entrepreneurs, and thank you again for the opportunity. You're welcome. And you know, I really like this, uh, the way that you've worded the focus of this conversation, because, you know, we can't eliminate risk in life, whether it's life or retirement or personal or professionally, but we can mitigate risks. And once we know what risks are, then we can go to work to help lessen them as much as possible. So I want to um, sit at your feet to listen to your wisdom of how you are working with your clients and mitigating risks. So get us started with kind of what some of those risks are that you're that you're addressing. Sure. Uh, so the, the three big risks um, in retirement that that are just sometimes are just pitfalls for a, a lot of people that they just don't see coming are longevity risk, uh, inflation risk, and portfolio risk. Mm. So yeah, yeah. Well, um, let's let's start with one longevity. I'm I'm certain that that means you know how long that we are living so that we can you know, make sure we have enough money. And I know if you read the news online or or wherever that we're as as Americans we're living longer than than we ever have before because we've got better health care, better nutrition, we're exercising better. So how does a longevity risk play out? It's a great you know it's it's, it's so interesting that when we think of the Social Security program when it was first created. So real quick, um, you know, backstory. Um, when the government came out with the Social Security um, Administration Department, and it was just to be a backstop for people who um, who lived too long, and the government mm. was going to go ahead and just provide uh, a benefit to 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 a small few, but have an opportunity to tax the many. And the original age, if you can recall, was the age of 62, you know? And so now, because of us as Americans, for the reasons that you've named, uh, great health care, you know, the opportunities for increasing um, and getting better with our nutrition and lifestyle, that number has now increased to 67. Um, mm-hmm. There are conversations in in Congress now about increasing that age even higher, um, because the Social Security Administration was never designed to have to pay for so many people. So when we think about longevity risk, the idea about living too long, which to me sounds like a blessing. Yep. <laughs> Especially if you have all of your wares about you, right? Um, but some of those items are when it comes to healthcare. Um, so Medicare, what does Medicare look like? What does long-term care look like? What is my what does housing look like for me? Where am I gonna live and how am I gonna be able to afford it? You know, so being well versed in those different strategies to mitigate some of the potential downfalls um, because when you think about that for most people in their uh, 20s through 50s, that one of their largest expenses is debt, right? So housing debt, car debt, consumer debt, and the like, um, that that number is their healthcare expense when they go into retirement. So wow. that number one expense for them is going to be health care, something that a lot of people just aren't familiar with. It's like, yeah, I know I pay for health care and I go and see the doctor and a dentist, you know, two or three times a year, um, try to do some items to kind of keep up with my health care. But to know that um, that health care is going to be a, an expense out of pocket, um, and that's if you're healthy. That's a so, that's a big hole in that bucket. 
Yes, that that yes. also that hole has a question mark on it because it's not something that's fixed. Correct. Correct. And the health, uh, the health insurance companies, they know that. And yeah. so um, I'm trying to go ahead and just be uh, as kind as possible. So the, but, you know, but knowing that health insurance companies, they're not non for profits, right? Yep. They're there to go yep. ahead and make a profit. Um, as we've, um, and I don't think that's going to surprise anyone who's a part of your audience. So knowing that, how do we go ahead and mitigate those costs and fees um, by not only ensuring and controlling our controllables when it comes to our own health, but also by being well-versed in the options that are available and how to best choose the options um, that are available to me based off of the way that the federal government has set up for us. Yeah. You know, when you think about these risks that you mentioned, longevity and inflation and portfolio risk, these tend to sound to me like other financial advisors typically don't address these because they're typically like, I can get you this rate of return or, you know, some of the broader things, but why aren't some of these topics uh, addressed by other advisors? Well, because the one of the biggest uh, opportunities to kind of mitigate um, that longevity risk, that healthcare risk, usually means taking funds out of the portfolio or oh. divesting those funds into other different types of options to kind of mitigate. And financial advisors, that, that means that for most financial advisors, that means that their portfolio has now decreased, which now means that they're getting a lower fee. Yeah. Um, it, I, so they're they're disincentivized. Way, it's <laughs> I hate to say it, but it's yeah. that way, but that's the biggest reason. Yeah, but isn't that exactly what you just said about the healthcare industry? Let's face it, you got to yeah. pay the bills and keep the lights on, and they're a for profit. Well, that mentality works with with your response there. Well, why wouldn't other you know, ideas and options, you know, be recommended? Well, because it doesn't benefit the financial planning firm. And that's not a slam on a firm or a person. It's just the way the industry works. So here you are kind of holding the torch going, let's talk about these things because I want my clients to be well cared for. You know, it's a blessing that I, you know, since I am independent, I'm an independent fiduciary, which means that um, I don't have some, you know, boss looking over my shoulder stating, you know, why are you offering that? You know, yeah. well, because it's the best thing that's for the client. Yes, but that's going to lower your fees. Well, you know what? That's going to all work out. Um, yep. yep. Um, but let's go ahead and do what's best for the client. That way, every mirror that I ever pass, I have no problem being able to look myself in the mirror. Yep. <laughs> That's a good point. So that, that other risk you mentioned, portfolio risk, give us a little synopsis of what that even means. Yes. So um, I don't know if you've ever heard the term sequence of returns. So the way that kind of works, so imagine that you have two people, let's go ahead and call them Mr. White and Mr. Black. Uh, both have had, um, you know, both start off with 100000 in their portfolio at the age of 40. And by the age of 60, let's say that that portfolio has now grown to 500,000, right? And so here they are. Um, now, let's say that the returns that they've received in those portfolios have been the exact opposite. So let's say that for uh, hypothetically for the first five years, Mr. White was getting returns of 10%, 12%, 8%. Mr. Black, you know, was getting 8%, 12%, 10%. Um, so the returns based off of their sequence for both Mr. White and Mr. Black um, have given them the same end result at the end because they're not taking out any kind of disbursement out of that portfolio. Yep. But Just once you retire... Now we're looking at a different story 
Because now when you're starting to go ahead and take out funds, and if you end up coupling that with returns in the market, returns in your portfolio, which are not conducive to your portfolio, either staying at its constant number or growing, now you're looking at compounding um, you're having compounding withdrawals. Meaning like I have to take out X amount of dollars, but this happens to be in a down year. So I'm taking a loss and I had to take money out. Exactly. Wow. Exactly. When you add that to an asset class, which is dying, uh, of course, I mean the bond market. Mm-hmm. You know, when you look at when, when, the traditional portfolio of stocks and bonds was cre- you know was created back in the 70s it was because stocks and bonds were the seesaw of each other right mm-hmm. stocks when you put money in stocks that means that you believe the company is going to become more profitable so the stocks are going to grow bonds means when you put money into bonds that means that this company is looking to borrow and you're making money off of the interest rate of the amount that you're loaning to them. So that when, in other words, when stocks are up, bonds are down. And when bonds are up, stocks are down. But what we've been experiencing since 2018, and then the um, when the pandemic occurred, it just exacerbated and took it to the nth degree to where now when stocks are up, bonds are up. And when stocks are down, bonds are down. Mm. So where is the asset class, which is going to be the opposite of that seesaw to ensure yep. that when I am taking returns out of my portfolio in retirement, that I'm not now experiencing that downward spiral of a decreasing, a decrease of my portfolio due to both negative or down returns plus me withdrawing funds as well. Yeah. That's so in a, other words, where's my downside protection? Yep. Yep. It, it, it kind of gets back to give me give me just something to count on. Give me some guarantees. I don't want to worry about risk and volatility. So that that explanation of sequence of returns is huge and that kind of ties into that portfolio risk. Um Right. I think, and at the same time that, too, we don't want to go ahead and put everything into guaranteed income mm-hmm. because that income that I'm receiving today in 2023 is not going to be this. It's not going to pay for the same goods and services in 2053 due to inflation. Because of so that's a that's a huge point because you think it's kind of like. Uh, it, it, you, like whack a mole, that old game you our kids played. <laughs> yeah. you, know, you whack this mole, and another one pops up right here, and it's like, shoot! I thought I had this figured out, and then inflation rears its ugly head. So, talk a little bit about how inflation then needs to be addressed, uh, uh in relation to the future purchasing power and affecting retirement. Right. So, um, as I've mentioned in a previous uh, episode, you know, I always like to go ahead and bring up a story of a postage stamp. Uh, mm. When my wife graduated from high school in 1993, a postage stamp cost 29 cents. It mailed one letter. Um, we all know that here in 2023, a postage stamp costs 66 cents. Mm. Same value. It still provides us, you know, for one postage letter, <laughs> right? You don't get yep. any more value from it. You don't get any more additional goods or services from it. But the cost has more than doubled. That's what inflation does. Yeah. Yeah. So So the money that you're making now, today, in 10, 20, 30 years, whatever time frame, is not going to buy the goods and services that we need as at the same level that that they will today. And we don't know the exact exact formula. We don't know the rate of inflation. We don't know the numbers, but we just know where the the trend is heading. Right, right. And, uh, you know, you brought up that whack-a-mole example. And usually for (laughs) clients, 
uh, that were DIY before they met me when it comes to their to their retirement planning. That's what their lifestyle looked like. You know, yep. they were playing whack-a-mole. And it's yep. like, let me oh fix this goodness. and let me fix this and let me fix this. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It's like, it's got to be so tiring because all you're doing is you're just being reactive to everything. Yeah. So wouldn't it be a lot easier just to be proactive? Yeah. And just play the, it? Pr- the problem is you, the traditional just man or woman on the street, they don't know how to be proactive. So I think it's really neat that you as a financial professional are talking about not keeping all of people's money in the market. So what's the proper mix? Where, what are you advising your clients on as far as we need to have a little bit of market exposure, but not everything. Where does, what does that look like? You know what? It's, um, it's, I, um, you know, I hate to use the, the financial advisor, term that we all use, but it, it does depend. It really does yeah. depend. Um, I, I do like to go ahead and say that um, I like to look at things from a, almost like a buckets approach uh, initially, you know, so um, a bucket as far as I like to go ahead and say your now bucket, your soon bucket, and your future buckets. So now, you know, meaning the funds that uh, that we have discuss that you foresee needing for the next 24 months, right? So whether it's your emergency plan, uh, do you foresee uh, purchasing some um, major vehicle in the next couple of years? Do you plan on wanting to finance that or pay that outright? Um, um, you know, as far as um, expenses for your home and healthcare and the like, but that, you know, first 24 months, and then another bucket going out for the next 10 years. And so, and then uh, your third bucket for 10 years plus. And that's going to be able to go ahead and help provide some guidance uh, when it comes to planning. Now, true, when you look at your portfolio, it may all just be one big number. Yeah. But we know exactly where to go ahead and draw upon those funds when that call comes to say, hey, we need to go ahead and take out X amount of dollars for this expense. Well, yes, because we plan for it. Or the call the next day where it's like, hey, we need to go ahead and take out X amount of dollars for this expense. And we didn't see this expense coming. That's okay. Because we have an emergency plan. (laughs) So we planned ahead. We 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 were proactive. So, yeah. Yep. So that's excellent. You know, and, and, and guess what? We didn't talk about what funds and Schools, the buckets are because that doesn't matter because it's different for every single person. Exactly. People, I just feel like this conversation is so helpful for people to hear the fact that here's some broad stroke uh, sage advice, really. And now, how would this look for my situation? And and what should I do? Now you're going to start asking more deep questions and really pulling apart some opportunities and making some recommendations. So I think that is the the thing that if if uh, maybe someone listening to this is going, you know, I talked to some advisor and they're shooting right off the bat product recommendations, that might not be an advisor to work with because they didn't know enough to even make a recommendation yet. Yeah, it's kind of like you know, taking your taking your your child out to go buy a vehicle and the salesperson points them to a minivan. And, yeah. and you're like, but I don't even know if a minivan is, is best for them. And it's like, well, but then the salesperson's like, but that's what I sell. Yep. <laughs> Let's put that square peg in a round hole. Let's just whack it in exactly. there. <laughs> exactly. So now let me go well, ahead and sell you while a minivan for a 17 year old is the best vehicle for them. Right. So <laughs> let, let's make sure that we're not just whacking a mole or fitting square pegs and round holes. If someone is interested in just really getting a good, clear picture of what they can be planning for and being proactive, Eddie, what's the best way that they can learn more and reach out and connect with you? Absolutely. That would be through our website at uh, www.harvestwealthplan.com. Uh, they can email me as well. They're Mike at Eddie. That's E D D I E at harvestwealthplan.com. So thank you. Excellent. Well, Eddie, thank you so much for coming back on. It's always a pleasure chatting with you. I just love your energy and perspective.
Mike, again, thank you for having me back on again. It's truly been a blessing and, and just an opportunity to go ahead and provide people just some uh, opportunities for peace, you know, when it comes yes. to, you know, to their, to their finances. So yes, thank you again for this opportunity. You're welcome. You've been listening to Influential Entrepreneurs with Mike Saunders. To learn more about the resources mentioned on today's show or listen to past episodes, visit www.influentialentrepreneursradio.com.